Hi there, thanks for watching. I'm inside Alice now. It doesn't really look very different to when you last saw it, um, but I'll explain why in a mo. And in this episode, I want to talk to you about why I, one year into living on an hour boat off grid, um, I'm changing from lead acid to lithium. When living on a boat, especially as a continuous cruiser, um, I don't have the luxury of plugging into a shoreline and having mains electricity. So I need to generate my own electricity, um, just like as someone living off the grid would, and store it somewhere. And that storage is in the form of a battery. Uh, they're deep cycle batteries, which means that they, they go through from empty to full. That's classed as a cycle. And there's, a lo there's lots and lots of different ones out there. The technology's been around for, what, 150 odd years. There's lead acid, there's AGM, there's gel. Um, I've got four lead acid aboard Alice. Um, right in the early days, I just wanted to get going and wanted electricity and, and get out onto the waterways. I've got four sealed lead acid. Each of them are 110 amp hours each. Now an amp hour is how many amps you can run for an hour. So 110 amp hours, in theory, you should be able to run one amp for 110 hours, but it's not as simple as that, especially with, with lead acid technology. When charging the lead acid type of battery, there's three stages of charging. There's bulk, which is when you can put about 80% of the, the power back into the battery. The battery just takes as many amps as you can throw at it and gets up to 80% full. That's fantastic. However, lead acid batteries like to be 100% full regularly. And it's that last 20% that has become a real pain. Because of the efficiency of, of lead acid technology, that last 20% takes hours and hours and hours. The very last stage of three-star ch charging is called a float because the battery likes to remain almost 100%. The float uh, just keeps it, keeps it high. It floats the voltage very, very... It's almost like a very slight trickle charge just to keep it, it topped up. Over the last year, during the summer months, it, the batteries were fine. I had lots and lots of solar, I would be out navigating the canals and rivers so the, the engine using its alternator would be charging the batteries and I had no real issues. The problem started to come in the winter months and solar in the winter months is heavily reduced regardless of the fact that I've got what 650 watts of solar on the roof which is quite a lot, that was nowhere near enough. Um, I was finding on the dark and, and dingy days of a, of a British winter that the solar was almost useless. So I was having to, every single day, charge my batteries with either my generator or my engine, which of course adds extra maintenance and fuel for both. Um, and that process, especially through the winter months, was, was really horrible. You're so conscious of the energy you use I turned my fridge off, which is the, the biggest consumer of electricity on the boat. That uses around about 45 amp hours a day. The problem with lead acid though is it's recommended to only take the, the depth of discharge down to 50%. So if you wanted 100 amp hours on the boat, you'd have to get 200 amp hours um, because you're only supposed to get them down to half. I, on an average day, consume around about 80 to 120 amp hours of power. Um, I've got four le sealed lead acid batteries on board Alice, um, and each of those are 110 amp hours. Um, so that equates to 440 amp hours, but think of only half, that's 
effectively 220 amp hours I've got available. And in the winter months, I was finding that not enough. I was charging every single day. On top of all of that, the lead acid technology, after about 100 to 300 cycles, depending on what manufacturer and what type of battery, it starts to depreciate. And that depreciation gets goes down and down and down and down and down. Um, and if you don't keep the battery topped up to 100%, the battery sulfate, which then depreciates them even more. And the use of battery monitors is, is completely useless to a certain degree. The technology inside them tries to cope with lead acid, but it doesn't know how sulfated a battery is. So it can quite regularly tell you oh yeah, your battery's at 85, 90% 90 full. And you're like, yay. But really, you've got to look at the voltage of the battery um, and see how many amps are still going in to get a real uh, feeling for how full the battery is. It's that three stage of charging that I have really hated, especially through the winter months. It's such a difficult task of constantly having to replenish the energy back into a battery every single day. Um, yes, you can get bigger battery banks, but then with a bigger battery bank, you've got to put more energy back into it. So that became quite a laborious task and I really hated it. So I, I personally had to look for an alternative. So today's the day, let's hope, fingers crossed, but I'm going to change from lead acid batteries to lithium. Let's see if they've arrived. I've decided to purchase lithium iron phosphate or LIFEPO4 or LFPs as they're sometimes referred to. Very, very stable uh, lithium technology. The earlier um, technology of lithium, you will have seen reports of, of batteries catching fire in people's pockets. Uh, mobile phones bursting into flames on planes or or catastrophic failures where um, planes have been carrying the earlier technology of lithium and the, the plane crashing and, and people dying on board. The technology's moved on and lithium iron phosphate is the very latest and very, very stable and very reliable. Good, thank you. Your nice lithium systems arrived this morning. I've decided to go with 12 volt lithium iron phosphate batteries. You can get 24 volts, but they're a lot more expensive. And then I would have to downgrade because everything on board is 12 volts. So I've gone with 12 volt type. They have four cells inside them. Each of them are connected in series and they're 3.2 volts each. So that gives 12 point eight volts of battery power which is in quite a, a good comparison to the traditional types of, of lead acid batteries so they can be switched in and out quite easily so what are the benefits of lithium technology well the the weight and the size can be anything up to 70 percent less than a lead acid the efficiency of a lithium battery is extremely high, um, from 90 to 99% efficient. So when I was talking about the absorption charge, where it can be as low as half, uh, that, that's out of the window now, that's gone with lithium. Also, lithium batteries can take a tremendous amount of power all in one go. There's none of this three-stage charging process. It takes as much power as you can give it and then right at the very end, it then tails off quite rapidly. But by then, the, the batteries are full. They have no history, unlike the early stages of lithium where you had to deplete them and then fill them back up and whatnot. That's, uh, that's all gone with life PO4s. They don't need 100% charge. Um, unlike a lead acid, which prefers 100% charge as much as you can, life PO4s really don't care. In fact, they perform better if you don't constantly leave them at 100% charge. It's a very stable voltage with, with lithium. With a lead acid, the more you use it, um, and the, the 
emptier the battery gets or if you take a lot of charge out of the battery in one go the voltage drops quite considerably. With a lithium it stays very very constant usually at around about 3.2 volts right the way to the very very end which is fantastic for equipment on the boat. Things will um, operate a lot better and in the short period that I've had my lithium already the fridge is not on as much. Things like the shower pump is working really well so much so that I open the shower door on the first morning and water sprayed out all over the floor whereas before okay with a hundred percent battery um, I would have a shower and it would contain the water inside the shower but um, now it's a lot powerful shower. Now that does have a, its pluses but also the, the negatives are I need to fill it with water more but that's not really anything to do with lithium. With battery monitors because the efficiency is so high it's a, almost a reverse. You ignore the voltage side because it stays stable for the majority of the time and I can now go back to looking at the percentage of a battery monitor which is quite a, a, a mind twist because you've, it's a, the opposite of what I've been used to for the last year. The last thing with regards to a lithium battery is the amount of cycles it can do. Um, a lead acid they can be as low as two to three hundred cycles which is from going from full to empty back to full again that's called a cycle. If you look after the batteries and you don't hammer lead acid and you don't take more than 50% out they will last a lot longer. Um, I've spoken to people that will have batteries for sort of eight to ten years but they've really had to look after them. A cheap and cheerful lead acid battery will only last one to two years. Cycles on the lithium that I've purchased if you only take 50% of the power out of the battery they will have sort of 5,000 cycles which is years and years of use. So if you're going to go with lithium there's three main areas of the type of lithium battery you could get. The first is going down the DIY route. Very very popular in the United States. They have a lot of importers, a lot of distributors of lithium batteries and a lot of RVs and people that live off the grid in motorhomes buy individual cells um, and then they increase the amount of cells to however many amp hours they want. Very popular makes are Winston, Calbs, uh, Sinopoly, that type of thing. They all come from China, Hong Kong area. They're all manufactured there but the US has got a, a strong amount of people using them. Here in the United Kingdom I can't find a single distributor in the UK. The closest distributor is uh, GWL Power and they're based in the Czech Republic. They are a main distributor for all of these types of batteries but I've only seen a few people going down the DIY route in the United Kingdom. On top of that one of the most popular battery management systems that sort of looks after the battery the manufacturer has decided not to sell to the DIY market anymore and concentrate on the trade. And lastly I would have loved to have gone down the DIY route and the battery management system have, has little um, printed circuit boards that are mounted on top of each of the battery cells and I was worried that one of those would get knocked off or damaged and if you disrupt the battery management system in any way or if it goes wrong you could jeopardize losing all your batteries. So despite the fact that I sort of knew what I was doing and I would really enjoy going down the DIY route I eventually decided that for me living on a boat um, I decided that probably wasn't the best option for me in the United Kingdom. A drop-in type of lithium battery is another popular choice. Gone with the Winds, the YouTube channel with Jason and Nikki, they've got drop-in batteries for example. I looked into getting them, I was very serious about getting them, I got quotations but when I looked into it I decided not to for three reasons really and they were personal to my circumstances. The first reason was when I'm spending upwards of nearly a thousand pounds on a battery I wanted to see how the cells were doing. I wanted cell reporting and drop-in batteries don't have that. 
The second reason is I wanted to be wanted to control things outside of the battery. For example, I wanted to switch a relay off to stop my solar or tell my inverter to stop giving charge. Again, a drop-in battery doesn't have that facility. And thirdly, for me, I can't use drop-in batteries in my engine bay. It's a cold area. The other day I put a thermometer in there. It was minus three outside the boat, minus one in my engine bay, because I've got a very long engine bay and it's away from the, the main living area, which is obviously heated. And I felt the claims that you can just drop them in and off you go were a little tiny bit exaggerated, in particular, with regards to the temperature. Be careful of where you put lithium batteries. Um, I'll talk about the temperature in a mo, but for me, uh, the drop-in capabilities of this type of battery weren't for me. So I've decided to go with a com combination of both of them. Um, it's all in one case, but I have the control externally to do things. I can also see the voltage of each cell um, and those batteries are made by Victron. Now I have a Victron Multi Plus inverter and charger. I have a Victron battery monitor. I have a Victron MPPT. I have a Victron color display. All of that data goes onto the web so I can monitor it on my mobile phone. And I wanted to uh, keep with the trend the Victron lithium batteries have a separate battery management system, but that can control other things. I'll be going into all of this in, in separate videos. Um, it also reports quite nicely and it communicates with both the MPPT and the MultiPlus. So that's the type of battery I've gone for. And because they are so efficient and I've spoken to Victron directly, you can add further batteries later on. So I've bought three 100 amp hour batteries purely because of cost and purely because of I don't know what's around the corner. I might decide in six months time to buy a, a great big computer to edit all these YouTube videos on, which then would require more power than my calculations have been in the last couple of weeks. And the beauty of buying a 100 amp hour lithium battery is it's a lot cheaper to add another 100 amp hour rather than another 300 because you do need to keep the consistency of the amount of amp hours. Yes, there's lots of positives with regards to a lithium battery, but as with all positives, there are of course negatives. The bad side of lithium batteries are you have to treat them in a certain way. You have to manage, manage them and that's where a battery management system comes in. Um, a lithium battery will fail irreversibly, in other words, dead, if um, its voltage, and this depends on what type of manufacturer, but if the voltage of one of the cells goes below between 2.5 and 2.8 volts, battery dead. Again, if you put too much charge in, and again, it depends on the type of manufacturer, but the um, voltage is between 3.9 and 4.2 volts into one of the cells, again, dead. Another area that a lithium ion phosphate battery will die is temperature. Now there's pluses and there's minuses. The pluses are they have a, a fantastic operating range of temperatures. You can uh, use them from below 20 degrees Celsius right up to 50 degrees Celsius and you can store them down to minus 45 degrees Celsius right up to 70 degrees Celsius. It's the same for all lithium iron phosphate batteries but the area where they will fail is when charging the battery at zero degrees Celsius or below. So I will be storing my batteries inside because I know my engine bay gets cold. But you can charge a battery when it's below zero degrees Celsius, but the charge has got to be heavily reduced. The calculations I've seen, and in the battery terminology, it's classed as 0.05C to 0.1C. What that really means is five to 10% of the battery's capacity. 
So for example, one of my batteries is 100 amp hours and in particular with Victron, they have a 0.05 C rating when charging below zero degrees Celsius. So I can't put any more than five amps into it, otherwise I will kill it. Basically, you've got to treat the battery really, really carefully if they are cold. So dropping them into an engine bay and ignoring the temperature will kill them. A lot of RVers and motorhome and caravan people have got around putting lithium ion batteries in lockers underneath the, the motorhome by controlling the temperature in the locker, either by heat maps or blowers or siphoning air in from the main cabin into the locker. All I can say is don't ignore the temperature environment that you're charging a lithium ion battery in. If you're going to put it in an area where it's at zero degrees Celsius or below and you want to charge them, of course you can use them, but if you want to charge them either with solar on the roof or with an alternator or what, however means, you've got to limit the amount of current going into them. Very, very cold mornings, um, especially recently, very, very frosty, very clear skies have plummeted the temperature down. That means that the engine bay is below freezing. The sun comes up, no clouds in the sky, bright sun, lots and lots of ice crystals or snow everywhere that bounces the light onto the solar. Fantastic for solar. The solar generates loads and loads of energy. Boom, you've killed your lithium batteries if you don't keep them in a warmer environment. So they're going to go inside in a kitchen cupboard where I have got the warmth of, of the main cabin and I will be detailing all of that process. It looks, I'm looking at that area right now behind the camera and there's cables everywhere and there's a lot of mess. So I've got to finish my testing of my lithiums and get on with installing in that cupboard. I will be detailing all of that area of all the extra bits of kit that I've bought in a number of videos. The biggest negative side of all of this is obviously on the old bank balance. Lead, acid are cheap. Um, you can get lead acid as low as under £100. And foolishly, ha I'll ha hold my hands up. I shouldn't have done that in the early days. I should have researched my energy properly. I shouldn't have bought lead acid personally. At the back of my head, I always thought that I might be going down the lithium route. That's probably why the majority of the vote hasn't been finalized because I haven't finalized my electrics. Um, it's all very temporary, even a year in. I've obviously gone online and looked at other YouTubers. There's um, a guy that's installing 24 volt Victron batteries in a, in a great big bus that he's gonna live on as well as lots of people going down the DIY route. Not many people talking about the smaller types of batteries, specifically 12 volts and mainly for Victron. I think that's probably because up until quite recently they've been really, really very expensive. So I've got quite a lot of from YouTube. I've also uh, gone to the Victron main website, read a lot of their stuff, a lot of their manuals. I'm one of these types of people that will read a manual from cover to cover before switching things on, despite sometimes desperately wanting to turn things on beforehand. So I've got a lot of information from Victron. Um, they've got quite an active um, area where you can post questions. Um, and a Victron representative will come back and answer them. I've gained quite a lot of information there. And I've also gained quite a lot from a Victron main dealer. The guys at Onboard Energy have also been extremely helpful. They have a showroom and they're based at um, Springwood Haven Marina. It's on the Coventry Canal between uh, Nuneaton and Atherston. They mainly specialise in um, supplying electrical equipment to marine, uh, automobile and off-grid um, markets. Um, a couple of very, very clever guys there. They do lots and lots of Victron installs and that is ultimately where I decided to buy my Victron batteries. Under full disclosure with you, I did get a very good deal with them. I did get a, um, a big chunk of money knocked off because of doing videos and because of mentioning them. However, um, I've been able to persuade them to give you some money off as well. 
they've given me a promo code, which is nice and simple to remember. It's all in uppercase and it's Jono Promo, J-O-N-O Promo, P-R-O-M-O, -O, all one word. If you put that into the checkout at the Onboard Energy um, shop area of their website, I will give a link in the description below, um, you'll get 15% off. So when you're talking about batteries, where in my um, instance, one of my 100 amp hour Victron batteries, the list price is £1,200, you get 15% off that. Um, when you're talking about multiple thousands, that's quite a lot of money off. So they've given both myself and you a very, very good deal there. Um, and they've got the knowledge as well that, that helped me enormously in the beginning. I will be detailing all of my install. Um, I'm aware I've just sat at a desk today, but I wanted to get the facts and figures over to you correctly, because if I get any of the, just a, a 0 0.1 of a voltage out, I'm sure I'd get hundreds and hundreds of comments. My temporary install has gone very, very well. I'm really, really pleased with them so far. And over the, the coming weeks, I will be doing the, the proper install of them in their cupboard in the, in the kitchen. So uh, thanks very much for watching and lots more of the install videos to come. And of course, I'm on my way to Shropshire Union Canal as well.